So now we're going to move to yet another aspect of uh, motor behavior, in this case, uh, motors at the, at the molecular scale. And uh, Krishanu Ray will tell us all about those. Okay, thanks, Upi, for uh, inviting me for this uh, workshop, and especially to Sita Bro for uh, keeping up with my <laughs> indiscretions. I thought the conference will start on 4th, so I landed up 3rd night. So Sita Prabhu was very kind to host me. So what I'm going to tell you today is uh, not so much as uh, neurobiology in true sense, uh, it should be called neurobiology. It's more of a, a molecular biology with uh, cellular uh, connotations towards it. It so happened that uh, this problem is best addressed in neurons which are the longest cells found in the body. So what I'm going to tell you is more about uh, the molecular properties of a protein, uh, what uh, is called motor protein. And this protein uh, literally like a locomotive uh, uh, utilizes the chemical free energy by burning ATP to generate mechanical motion. And using this mechanical motion, it uh, literally walks uh, on a tight rope, uh, stepping on uh, filamentous uh, proteins such as microtubule or actin filaments. In this case, it is microtubule and takes a very precise 8 nanometer step on uh, every beta tubule and subunit on a microtubule. And, and so what I'm going to tell you today is the properties of one particular type of motor protein, which we called kinesin 2, which is a, I'll tell you more in detail and introduce you the motor uh, itself and which is involved in very specific set of transports inside the cell. And uh, so I will give you an overview of these transport processes and I'll tell you, you know, more uh, in detail about one aspect of kinesin 2 mediated transport in the neuron today. Uh, what we use is a model organism uh, to do this analysis which is called uh, fruit flies. Uh, it's a very nice, uh, cute looking pet that we all have in the lab. And uh, most of the approach I use are uh, molecular biology and, and imaging. Uh, I don't have to introduce this to the audience. The only reason I put it up here is for you to remember one simple rule, which is that all the proteins that are needed to make the synapse functional both uh, you know, mo mostly at the presynaptic terminal and not so much at the postsynaptic terminal, are made in this part of the neuron and taken all the way through the axon to the presynaptic compartment. And that makes it one of the longest uh, logistics of transport inside the cell. You know, in uh, some of these axons, it can be several meters long. So the question uh, that we uh, wanted to ask is you know, how these material that are made in the cell body of the neuron finds its way to the presynaptic compartment and how does the balance of this material at the presynaptic compartment are maintained. You know, why is it that if you, you know, run uh, quite extensively, your uh, synapses don't go dry. You know? Somehow you know, they keep resuscitated and keep going. Uh, so that is a question that excited me for a long period of time, and I really haven't got the answer to this question. But we, are, we have defined a system where we can now ask uh, this question and try to find an answer. Uh, the axons of, uh, are a variety, you know, there are lots of different types of axons that are there in the body. Uh, the most prominent one, which is this uh, squid giant axon, which is several millimeters wide and runs several centimeters along the body of the squid, which you can actually see, you know, it's really a visible uh, axon. Uh, whereas the others, like the sciatic nerve, which are inside it, are also quite big and runs uh, several meters long. And the axonal transport deals with the phenomena that uh, maintains the movement of both vesicular material as well as soluble proteins through this axon to the presynaptic compartment. Most of the axons doesn't carry ribosomes, so most of these are proteins that are transported uh, through the axon by using these molecular motors. 
these are the two examples of uh, vesicular transport and organelle transport in the axon taken from uh, a drosophila larva, which is at the uh, first instar stage, where it has this nice you know, pattern of uh, sensory neurons and uh, interneurons, which are the, you know, this is the larval brain. And what, is, what I'm showing you is a movie recorded from this part of the sensory neuron. This is the cell body over here. And the vesicles are marked with one of the presynaptic vesicle protein called uh, synaptobrevin. And you can see there are lots of these uh, movements that are going on over here, which are both bidirectional. This is mitochondria labeled with, again, fluorescent protein. And what, again, you can see is that there are you know, both stationary and uh, mobile uh, organelles in the axon. And this little twitch tells you that when we recorded, this animal was alive and intact and trying to wriggle out of the trap that we set in. So the question is, you know, why does these movements look so different? And uh, is there any regulation in these, uh, in these in this movement pattern. It reminds me of the you know, city traffic uh, in a way. Uh, it's quite crowded, especially if you go to cities like Pune uh, or Bombay. Uh, you'll see you know, a lot of traffic jams in, once in a while. Then there are clear highways. You know, some traffic will move through it, and so on. And apparently, like this uh, chaotic traffic in uh, Bombay and Pune and many other Indian cities, the traffic inside the neuron also has some kind of an order and organization. And it doesn't really fail, because if it fails, then uh, I won't be standing here and talking about it towards you. Uh, the movements inside the axons uh, generally happens in three gross uh, rates. The, the rates which are sort of uh, at this range that is 20 to 400 millimeter per day, is considered to be the fast axon, axonal transport, and the examples of which I just showed you. Uh, the other rates, which are uh, much slower, considered to be the slow axonal transport, were traditionally thought to be a, a slow diffusive process, which has just, in you know, the last few years, have been proved to be not a uh, slow diffusive process at all, which are actually mediated by the motor proteins with long pauses instead of the short pauses in case of the fast transport. So the, the motor transport, uh, motor mediated vesicular transport uh, was first discovered uh, or, or the clue came from this picture published long ago. And there people showed that the vesicles inside the axons are linked to the microtubule filaments through these you know, bilobed structures which were considered to be the motor proteins. And then later on, it turned out that these, and indeed, when these proteins were purified, turned out that they indeed are mechanochemical ATPases, which has this uh, head domains, which bind to the microtubule filament. It has a, a stalk and a globular tail domain. And if you purify these motors and uh, uh, bind them to uh, plastic beads and put them on, uh, on cover slips, you can see that they, you know, uh, on microtubule on cover slips, they, these motors can pull these glass beads, artificial cargoes, in a very systematic fashion on, on the microtubule. So therefore, one can use a neuronal system, which is kind of one-dimensional because it has all the plus end of the axons, microtubules towards this side of the axon, and all the minus, sorry, the plus ends on this side, and the minus end towards this side of the axon. And the traffic moves either towards the synapse or back from the synapse. So one can take this system and ask, how does different cargoes are, you know, sorted over here, sent towards the presynaptic compartment, and then brought back to the cell body. The system we use is a, uh, the cholinergic uh, nervous system in Drosophila larva. And this is a layout of the cholinergic larval system, uh, where you can see this is the, uh, the larval brain, which has the largest density of the cholinergic synapses. 
Uh, in fact, in Drosophila, all the cholinergic synapses are found in the, in the central uh, nervous system and none on the neuromuscular junction. And then it has the sensory neurons, which are also cholinergic. They send their uh, input to the brain. And this is the pattern of different cholinergic neurons. And this is the axon that goes to the brain. Uh, if you uh, open up a larval system and uh, label uh, presynaptic vesicle, in this case, it's a RAF4 uh, labeled uh, vesicle, you can record movements uh, in a very persistent way that keep it, these vesicles keep moving uh, in these segmental nerve neurons. So these are, these are essentially the sensory uh, axons that are sending their cargoes towards the synapse. And these, these are sort of, this movement occurs at a rate of about one microns per second and has a uh, you know, persistence of run length of one micron on an average. This was one of the most unusual uh, runs we recorded, which has uh, about seven microns uh, run length. And it was, it kept going, you know. Uh, our recording period was 10 seconds, and uh, if we recorded longer, probably we have gotten this run even longer. So, so this is an indication that these, some, some of these vesicles can run really persistently for a long distance in the axon. The axonal apertures are quite narrow. Uh, so this is a uh, cross-section of the segmental nerve. And uh, the, the movement that I showed you are, uh, probably happens in one of the sensory neurons, which has about 200 to 300 uh, nanometer aperture. And typically, uh, it uh, contains about 10 microtubule filaments. And often, you know, the, the space is uh, filled up with large organelles such as mitochondria. And therefore, this vesicle that I showed you have to negotiate through this crowded space while moving in the neuronal aperture uh, through the axon. Now, if there is a uh, defect in the motor function or the motor protein that moves these vesicles in the axon, then that can lead to the uh, defective transport or failure in the transport and accumulation of these cargoes in the in the axon, you can consider this some kind of a traffic jam in the axon, which is, uh, you can see here, this is a normal cross section where the axons are fairly narrow. And when the traffic jam happens, this axon swells up. This kind of uh, transport defect usually leads to the uh, reduction in the synaptic activity because the synapses become smaller. And due to these, it develops some sort of a posterior paralysis. And this larva generally walks tail up. Now, these kind of systems are now known to happen in human disorders also. There are several human disorders which are now linked to the dysfunction of motor protein at different levels, like the amyotropic lateral sclerosis, which is sort of uh, now li uh, linked to the dynein heavy chain mutation. Then there are uh, uh, CMT uh, type disorders which are linked to KIF1B, but I was told recently that this is not correct. But uh, definitely the Huntington type disorders are now you know, linked with the. So today I'll focus mostly on the one particular uh, inherited disorders which attracted a you know, lot of imaginations and interest, and that is the Alzheimer's disease. I'm not going to tell you anything about Alzheimer's disease today. What I'm going to tell you is this cholinergic hypothesis about Alzheimer's disease, where it is predicted that uh, the defect in uh, acetylcholine, uh, cholinergic synaptic activity could lead to uh, the beta amyloid uh, plaque formation. And that, in turn, can affect the reduction in the uh, cholinergic activity of the brain. So I'll focus now on one particular component of this cholinergic synapse, which is cholinesterol transferase. And this is a very important enzyme which is needed to recycle uh, choline into acetyl acetylcholine and keep the synapse going. It's a soluble protein which is located, which is shown to be transported in a diffusive, slow diffusive manner in the axon. And this is the data which shows the uh, the rate at which the acetylcholinesterase activity uh, grows over a period of time. Uh, 
and and in contrast sorry the choline acetyl transferase activity in contrast to the acetylcholine esterase activity and the most of these uh, enzyme is uh, located uh, as you can see over here in the larval brain at the presynaptic boutons uh, right here the green is the choline acetyl transferase and the red is the acetylcholine esterase so it's a soluble protein present mostly in the synapse but made in the cell body of the neurons which are located uh, quite far away so typically in this case uh, several microns away from the synapse so how does this soluble protein reach the synapse we initially showed that uh, the uh, mutation in kinesin 2 which is a heterotrimeric complex of two motor subunits and a, a non motor accessory protein uh, which looks something like this, which has these two motor heads, a stalk, and a globular tail domain. This is the cartoon that represents the kinesin 2, which we showed that the accessory protein binds to the stalk, and the motor has a, a flexible uh, uh, stalk domain which opens up at the end terminal end. And it has a different uh, implication in its mechanical activity. So, so what we then did was we wanted to understand how exactly kinesin 2 regulates uh, char transport in the axon and we used a, a photo bleach recovery assay where we just bleach part of the uh, synapse or the axon and look at the rate at which it recovers and these uh, neurons were uh, genetically modified to express a GFP uh, conjugated uh, choline acetyl transferase which again localizes to the presynaptic compartment and this is an indication of how it happens uh, so if you you know bleach parts of the uh, axon uh, and let it recover you will gradually see the fluorescence uh, will recover in this axon from but it never reaches the the initial state of fluorescence because there's always some amount of the static fluorescence that you that accumulates this is the rate at which the regular GFP which is the considered to be just diffusing in the axon recovers and if you, if you sort of compare these two uh, movies you will immediately recognize that the recovery rates are much slower in case of GFP char. Uh, we then uh, found that the recovery rates of GFP char is proportional to the recovery rates of the, the motor uh, that is considered to transport this protein and then showed that the uh, motor indeed binds to this uh, protein through one of its tail domains. And this is the, uh, the final experimental data. What we did was we created two different animals, one uh, expressing a kinesin 2 without one of these tails, and the other expressing a full length motor with both tail intact. And we found that the animal which uh, expresses a kinesin 2 motor without the tail uh, uh, cannot pull down the choline acetyl transferase although the motor is, is intact whereas the, if the tail is present then it pulls down both the recombinant and the endogenous protein. And this is just a, a genetic rescue experiment to show that the, the tailless motor cannot rescue the recovery as much as the full length motor which is shown here and this recovery rate is much smaller than the regular recovery of diffusive GFP. So this suggested that kinesin 2 directly interacts with choline acetyl transferase through one of its tail domains and it uh, and this interaction is critical for its movement in the axon. This was quite surprising because uh, uh, soluble proteins were uh, shown to transport in aggregates in the axon and these aggregates were you know shown to transiently form and uh, were not shown to associate with, with any particular motor. So here we find that a very you know, specific example of a soluble protein which directly binds to a motor protein and then you know, apparently it moves in the axon. When we made the chymographs of these, of these recovery movies, we found that unlike the GFP which has a bidirectional uh, recovery pattern which is a typical of a diffusive recovery, the uh, GFP uh, char recombinant protein has a unidirectional recovery and this recovery is blocked in kinesin 2 mutant also and it cannot be rescued by the tailless motor but it can be fully rescued by the full length motor protein 
And this pattern is similar to the pattern of the motor itself, which shows this uh, biased uh, anterograde moving uh, recovery pattern. But what was interesting in this uh, chymograph is that we don't see any uh, line or you know, linear traces of the recovery, which Sandhya will show you tomorrow more in her uh, talk, which is the typical of vesicular uh, transport in the axon. What we see is a very gradual uh, you know, uh, kind of recovery, which looks very similar to the recovery of the diffusive GHP. Now, this is what people have shown earlier, where you know, the uh, soluble, uh, sorry, I think I forgot to link up the movie. It will not play. Uh, but you have to imagine that you know, uh, in case of the other known slow component transport, uh, the cargos which are transported in slow component, People have shown that these uh, like neurofilaments form a, a filamentous structure, and these filamentous structure move persistently towards either anterograde or retrograde direction. Or in case of the soluble, other soluble proteins such as uh, synapsin, uh, synuclein, and uh, 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 glucose synthase, they uh, form these little aggregates which sort of slowly move along the axon. So therefore, the cholinesterol transferase movement is quite distinct and different from the other soluble cargo that move in the axon. So the question is, how does this movement uh, gets regulated? Uh, what we found was that uh, this movement is not constitutive. It happens only for a brief period during the uh, larval lifespan. And uh, the example is shown here that you know, it picks up around uh, the larval age of 78 hour. Uh, and then it comes back again within an hour. So there is a brief period in which the movement uh, takes place, and otherwise it remains at the basal level. So in other words, kinase N2 uh, can only uh, bind to cholinesterol transferase for one hour in these axons and transport them through these axons, and after that one hour period, they somehow disengage with these cargo. Incidentally, the, when we looked at uh, kinase N2 motor alone, we found that the motor moves, uh, recovers consistently at all stages of the larval life. So that indicates that the motor keeps moving consistently, but the cargo can be only moved for one hour during this period. So it is uh, quite uh, you know, perplexing for us at that moment, point, point of time, which we have now uh, analyzed further and we, uh, it turned out that there is a sort of global uh, queue which is uh, present all along the axon. In this case, the data that I showed you is only recorded in a 10 micron axon. We have subsequently done analysis in a 2 millimeter axon at different positions. And again, we find the same phenomena that all along the axon, there is a global queue which uh, triggers the motor cargo interaction. And then as if the entire bulk, which is present in the entire axon, starts moving together uh, like a large, big train towards the uh, synapse. And then after that one hour period, the whole uh, train stops. And you know, again, the bulk uh, remains. So this showed that the bulk soluble uh, protein that are present in the axon doesn't have a, you know, a particular uh, start or stop uh, kind of a movement. They, they present in the bulk, and the motor which is moving has a you know, the periodic uh, association and dissociation with this cargo, and that causes a sort of uh, a period in which the whole bulk will uh, move in the axon, and then a period when nothing will move at all. Uh, this kind of explains the bulk movement behavior of many other soluble cargos that has been shown to move in a similar fashion in the axon. But we need to sort of analyze it even further and understand more in detail about the molecular biology of this cargo motor interaction to, to you know, get a further clarity on this regulation of this process. And that's where the whole idea is, uh, you know, rests right now. How much time do I have left? OK, good. So then I'll now switch from uh, this uh, study to the another study which is more biological and in a, in a way which, is, which will give you an idea about the consequence of this char transport that I showed you just now. 
So uh, when we looked at the, uh, the axons in this mutant where the char transport is defective, what we found was two kind of phenomena. One, that there were this large electron dense material which is accumulated in the axon. And you know, it sort of delighted us. We thought that, OK, God, we got the, we got the, cha, uh, the phenomena which showed that there is a huge accumulation of soluble protein in the axon. That's how you could get this. Uh, but then we also found uh, the, in some other axons uh, these kind of uh, small vesicular accumulates which were uh, present in uh, you know, many of these mutant axons. And we were surprised about to find this kind of a vesicle accumulating in the axon. These were very small vesicles, which are not generally known to be present in the axons. These are really tiny, about 30, 30 nanometer vesicles. So in order to find uh, the reason behind these vesicle accumulations, we went back to the literature. We uh, studied uh, and we found that kinesins are known to associate with many different uh, RABs. And these RABs are kind of a molecular switch which allows the motor to uh, hook onto a vesicle and or you know, get dissociated from the vesicle. And, and this switch works by hydrolyzing GTP. So if RAB is in the on state, it will allow the motor to bind the vesicle uh, as compared to if it is in an off state, which will disengage the motor from the vesicle. And there was one RAB which was uh, for, attracted our attention, and that was RAB4 which was uh, shown to uh, bind to kif 3 b which is one of the kinesin-2 motor homologs in mice and humans. And in our case, this will be called KLP64D in Drosophila. Uh, but how exactly it interacts was not very clear. But this interaction was shown to play a role in moving uh, late endosomal vesicle in the cells uh, after endocytosis. Incidentally, RAF4 is also uh, a protein which is enriched at the uh, presynaptic uh, uh, compartment and is transported in the axon from the cell body to the synapse. And therefore, you know, we used a RAF4 MRFP conjugated uh, fly which expresses uh, RAF4. And this is a uh, combination stock which shows both uh, cholinesterol transferase and RAF4 localization in this cholinergic synaptic boutons. This is a normal uh, axon where you see uh, uh, that the, the, RAF4, the small RAF4 vesicles are present uh, occasionally. This is a mutant uh, axon where you see this large uh, accumulation, accumulation of the RAF4 vesicles. So uh, you have to now, you know, uh, uh, OK, so this is in you know, an unpublished gave you a very tight correlation, but it suggests that the axonal transport and synaptogenesis are linked. And uh, in this case, at least, the cholinesterol transferase and raf mediated vesicular transport uh, are engaged in uh, synaptogenesis in the larval brain. We're still you know, working on it to find a more uh, tight correlation and understand exactly how the axonal transport and synaptogenesis are exactly correlated. We want this ideal data where we want to see, uh, pick one identified cholinergic neuron and show that the you know, synaptogenesis, uh, the axonal transport precedes synaptogenesis. That involves both uh, fluorescence uh, live imaging, correlating it to the electron microscopy. And uh, hopefully, next time, I'll be able to talk more in detail about that. Uh, so this is where I have to end my talk. Uh, I, when we, I, I, so I'll just simply give you the take home message at the end. Generally, intuitively one thought that the, you know, the intracellular transport by the motor proteins would have this kind of a, a three step process where the motor will bind a cargo and then, you know, it will run persistently for a you know, distance and then it will deliver the cargo. So far, what we have start, uh, found out by looking at very, uh, two different types of transport in the Drosophila neuron, uh, it doesn't really you know, uh, support this intuitive hypothesis. There is no uh, fixed pickup point in which the motor seems to bind the cargo, and uh, there are no you know, defined uh, lengths of runs uh, that the motor has to go through. 
it seems quite uh, random that the motor, you know, a cargo can move for a, a certain distance. And for different cargoes, the distance they move are quite uh, diverse. However, there seems to be a, a global regulation of this whole process where the cargo and motor interactions are globally regulated. What is it that regulates it that we still don't understand? It could be a synaptic activity, it could be the action potential or you know, a surge in calcium release in the axons. But this is something that we want to uh, investigate more in detail in further. And interestingly, the cholinergic system is so well, uh, pharmacologically well uh, uh, studied that we will have lots of different pharmacological uh, agents to play with to, to perturb the synaptic activity of this cholinergic system and study its correlation to the transport. So with this, I stop here. Uh, uh, these are some of the recent publications where we described uh, most of these data. Uh, some of it I did not talk today. Uh, I need to acknowledge the people whom, who has been the most instrumental in getting all these results. Uh, the results I, I spoke today is mostly uh, done by Aparna, which is, who has just finished, finished her PhD thesis. And uh, the EMs were done by Seema in the lab. And the project is now carried on by Swagata and Anuttama, uh, two, two of my PhD students. And uh, these are the other uh, students whom, whose work I didn't get a chance to talk here today. I'll probably talk about in a more appropriate uh, situation. Uh, so I just uh, want to take uh, one minute of your time to uh, advertise uh, this recent uh, a, a school that we are going to organize shortly. Uh, so this is, will be more, so this school is going to be organized to explore the link between the axonal transport and the neurodegenerative disorder in two parts, one part in Bombay and one part in Mahabaleshwar. And uh, fortunately, we got a very good set of speakers uh, you know, who are the most ex uh, expert in the field to talk about this, this topic. Uh, the deadline, you will get more details if you go to this website. Uh, the deadline is now extended by one month. Instead of uh, 19th November, we will accept applications till 19th December. So if any of you are interested to uh, attend this school, please apply. Uh, it's open to everybody, you know, both physicists and biologists. And uh, we'll, we'll try to sort of accommodate as many applicants as possible. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Krishanu. And just uh, to preempt uh, any the questions, I just wanted to say that actually to me this this kind of molecular level work is very very intimately linked with the systems level function and the behavior of cells because of course uh, all questions about homeostasis, um, the formation of the connections and so on, in the end they rely on this kind of transport and molecular movements and control to set them up. Yeah. So now, one of the most interesting and exciting thing would be to study how, you know, the uh, learning process, when you keep stimulating it regularly, affects the uh, transport. Absolutely. I'm going to catch you yeah. and others later. But anyway, right now, questions, please. Thank you, sir, for a very enlightening lecture. I have a very basic doubt. Uh, we have a molecular movement in both the directions in the axon. Yeah. So how do the motor proteins, they regulate the bidirectional movements? The motors are intrinsically designed uh, to walk only in one direction. So there are either plus n directed motor or minus n directed motor. So these RABs, which are instrumental in uh, regulating the uh, flow, they can actually uh, recruit a specific kind of motor, for instance. You know, the RAV4, for instance, can recruit kinesin 2. And then once it recruits kinesin 2, since the axon has a uniform layout of the uh, microtubule with the plus end towards the synapse and minus end towards the cell body, so therefore the motion will go towards the synapse. Whereas if some other RAV comes in, uh, like RAV5 or RAV6, which will recruit dynein, 
then the flow will go backwards towards the cell body. So this is how one can control the direction of movement uh, of this uh, material in the cell. In addition, there are these kinases which, and phosphatases. So uh, phosphorylation of certain kinesin, we still don't know about kinesin 2, but certain other kinesins uh, can, be, can activate the motor function uh, and dephosphorylation can deactivate the motor function. And this is uh, very well studied in case of chromosome segregation where the Aurora B kinase can activate SNP motor and the, the whole thing will move towards the center of the cell. And then a PP2 mediated phosphatase activity will dephosphorylate and inactivate the motor and so that the chromosome doesn't go back, you know, stays there. So yeah, so this is how the movement is, the direction of the movement is regulated. By intrinsically designing, uh, intrinsic design in the motor, which the motor is unable to walk other ways and, uh, and setting up the network, the, the railways in a way. So for following up on, on that question, so the motors that carry information back uh, towards the, uh, the cell body, cell, cell body will have to be transported down? In an, in will have form? to be transported, exactly, it's a very good point. Yes, so it was shown that dynein, for instance, piggybacks on kinesin heavy chain. So kinesin 1 is transported, uh, transports dynein all the way from the cell body to the synapse. And while it is transported, the dynein goes, remains inactive. So dynein has to maintain, has to be maintained in a constant inactive state while it is being transported. Yeah. We did not, uh, we did a very limited uh, uh, FRAP analysis of GFP tubulin. Unfortunately, the tubulin subunit we used are not axonally enriched. So we need to find a, a proper axonal uh, tubulin. This, yeah, I, I have more data for the cilia in this tubulin. It's very slow. It's uh, you know, uh, about uh, four orders of magnitude slower than the cha. So far, I don't know about any such. Uh, who? Junk. Uh, is there any such global regulation of junk? No. Anyway, we'll we'll uh, talk about it later. Okay, then, if there are no more uh, questions, uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers for this uh, of this morning session, which has spanned a very very wide range of topics. So thank you very much.